On the line, I have an author. His book, A Black Man in the White House, is, of course, about our first black man in the White House. Former President Barack Obama, uh, Cornell Belcher, joins us. What's up, Cornell? How are you, my friend? Uh, thanks for having me on. I'm honored. I appreciate it. Man, I, uh, I'm excited about uh, your book, Black Man in the White House. Uh, tell us about your book. Well, you know, the book is, and, and as a poster, I, I'm, I'm coming at the book from a, from a, both a data perspective, but I'm also giving you some history to make an interesting story because publishers say, well, Cornell, you can't do this, write a book about polling data uh, because only you nerds would, would read it. Uh, so I try to tie in a story uh, using the data, but also the history of how racial, how race matters has really impacted uh, American politics o o over the years, you know. When we, and I, and I had the honor to be a part of both Obama's presidential campaigns, but the 2008 campaign was, of course, something, something magical. And you'll remember, and most of your listeners will remember, there's a lot of talk in this country, right, after 2000, after the 2008 election about a post-racial America, right, and how was this the beginning of some sort of post-racial America and how this was a major breakthrough. Uh, you know, a, a major breakthrough uh, in race relations and 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 what and what have you. And I wanted to believe, like most of us wanted to believe, that you know it was a major racial breakthrough, and we were on this sort of cusp of a post-racial America. And so I had been doing polling around issues of sort of racial aversion going into the campaign, and. I really wanted to keep it up, sort of through the course of his of his presidency. Because in my mind, I was hopefully going to going to watch sort of a decline in racial aversion, meaning sort of negative attitudes toward uh, toward toward people of color uh, over the course of his presidency. But unfortunately, uh, quite the opposite, uh, in fact, happened. Not only did we not become post racial America, in fact, racial aversion rose over the course of of his presidency. While you know from from the track. Of, of, of my data, um, quite frankly, as a reaction to that. Uh, and, and really, so for many, you know, I said on election day, 2008, you had two really, you had two electorates. You had one electorate that was comfortable with diversity and then self was very diverse. And you had an electorate on the other side that was uh, less than a majority who were very anxious uh, and not comfortable with, with diversity and the demographic change that we're, that we're seeing taking, taking place in this country. And to a certain extent, this is what I talk about in my book, to a certain extent, Barack Obama, for many who played a zero-sum uh, sort of racial tribal game, Barack Obama really, and sort of the coalition that he represented, was really for the first time a real challenge to white political supremacy in this country. Because you understand, you know, Barack Obama didn't break through because he won more white voters. And in fact, in 2012, we won, what, 38% of white voters. So because of demographics, for the first time, you know, in the history of our country, you have, you know, the choice of the vast, vast majority of white voters not becoming, in fact, the person who occupies the White House. And, you know, that part does not get mentioned as much and I think even when black folks talk about it, you know how we talk, we're in the barbershop and stuff, we're not talking real numbers, but, you know, people will say, like you say, we'll almost lean on, hey, look, you know, you know, white folks were the ones who elected Barack Obama, which, you know, of course, obviously, in a, in a predominant, a predominant, the predominant society is, a, is obviously a huge factor there. But what you just said is rarely talked about on television. You know, I, I think that's something that that's, I hadn't even heard that. You know what I mean? And, and that kind of help, it, help, it helps explain kind of what's really going on. And, you know, so what's your what's your theory, uh, Cornell, looking at the numbers as Obama, the longer he was in office, the more the more aversion kind of happened. Was that the was that the the feeling by some white folks that there was a slipping, the kind of a changing of the guard? Is that what, what, what was driving the aversion? Well, you, yeah, well, I mean, there's, I mean, there's both my data that, that, that talks about this, but there's also sort of outside sources data, and sort of as, as a researcher, you want to, you know, both your data, but also outside source research. And we shouldn't be surprised by the backlash. Is what the bottom line is, because look, understand, you know, tribalism isn't new in 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 the world, and we just don't talk about it in, in, in America, right? Uh, but but there's, you know, some researchers from from Northwestern, you know, I, several months back did the study that that showed, you know, that 
talks about how, quite frankly, when you have uh, a group who feel they feel anxious and they feel threatened uh, and there's uncertainty, they will pull in, right? They will become more nationalistic, more conservative. And that's exactly what we've seen in, in this country as as demographics are destiny, right? It, it is... The, the the wolf is the, the wolf is at the door. Uh, I mean, Barack Obama's sort of a coalition and and his victory sort of brought the, the the wolf to the door, right? And the wolf is that you know over the next you know a little over a decade, a lot of these battleground states are going to be uh, close to plurality minority, right? Uh, so we are getting browner, and and politically that means that brown people. Uh, are, you know, in a democracy, are, are flexing their political muscle and they're deciding, you know, who's running the country and, and they're making political decisions on that. So you do have a real sort of sense of a loss of power among what has historically been the dominant uh, political group in, 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 in America. And so there's this sense of anxiety about that, right? And I don't want to point, and in the book, I talk about this, you know, I'm not, not pointing the finger and sort of saying, you know, those people are bad. Because quite frankly, you know, we have to understand the anxiousness that some people have about the changes in America. Because in the end, for better or worse, we lose the future if we don't sort of, if we don't um, find ways to inoculate this conflict. Because, because look, we're not going to get wider as a country. We're only going to get we're only getting browner. You know, the next you know twenty years or so. You know, nationally, we're close to a majority minority country, right? So, as and as we become more and more diverse, uh, the racial aversion grows and the conflict uh, grows uh, grows more and more. This is how our democracy ends. If we don't solve for this, right? So, so while other countries are preparing, and you know their populations and their children to compete in the global marketplaces, we have a you know over the last well last at least four years, you've had a Congress that is literally non-functioning, right? Completely dysfunctioning because the Republicans say they're going to block everything the president does, does not because they disagree with the on the issue, but because quite frankly they want to make him a failed president, and that's not my. Words. That's the words of who is the guy who is now the Senate Majority Leader. <laughs> it's amazing, man. Cornell Belcher is the author. The book is A Black Man in the White House. Cornell, you know, hearing this, and again, you don't see this kind of conversation. It does framing it. It really does make you understand that, like you said, what's kind of really going on is the last call for alcohol <laughs> for people, people who are afraid. And, and you can't stop the machine. So it is interesting. Like, like the way you're framing it makes me look at it totally different. And I think, like, even when you talk about movements like Black Lives Matter, the interesting thing is you're saying that, in a sense, what would be more powerful is if people, uh, brown people, organized and just started to vote and participate because just like those people uh, who voted for a lot of the people who voted for Trump who were, who were who were apathetic and weren't really involved in the process and finally did and made a huge difference, if those people who aren't participating, if they just participated, that would be a huge change. So it's very interesting how you're framing this, and I'm so excited. I can't wait to check out the book, man. It's available everywhere. It's available everywhere. Go on Amazon and get it quickly. But it should be in your bookstores. It's not in your bookstores. Tell the bookstores to order it. <laughs> Cornell, so give us your take. Now, you know, Trump comes in and he, he uh, you know, in less than 10 days, he's trying to rip off all of the uh, things he said he would do to satisfy his base. Uh, how do you think this party ends? It seems kind of crazy right now. <laughs> well, it is crazy. But again, let's take the historic perspective on it. Well, one, let's, let's also understand what we're dealing with. Donald Trump is a, is a minority president. And I say that in, in that he it's almost flukish. Right. He is someone with, with less than a plurality. He's a 46 percent president. You know, so, you know, this ideal that you, you, one of the things that for context of the of conversation, you know, your folks need to understand that this is not someone, regardless of what he says, it's not someone who brought in the Republican tent, who brought in millions and millions of new sort of voters and, and, and to sort of take over the country. No, D- Donald Trump got less of a percentage of the vote than, than Mitt Romney and John McCain. OK, so there's that. Right. But when you look at and this is the conversation we're going to have with our young people, 
when you look at, uh, and I'm going to go back even for one step further and, and get sort of in the data weeds with you. So one of the things in 2008 we knew we had to do, and this is what then candidate Obama, then Senator Obama talked about, was we have to expand the electorate. You have to change the face of the electorate. You have to make the electorate look more like, in fact, the population uh, of the country. And in 2008, we had 11% of our vote, 11% of the voters in 2008 were, were people who hadn't participated in the process anymore, which is huge, right? And without that increased participation, Barack Obama's probably not president. But disproportionately, that 11% were made up by younger, browner people, right? They were the ascending, they looked more like the ascending American electorate than the old American electorate. Uh, and when you look at this election that just happened, it was, the, the electorate overall was at that browner than the electorate we had in 2012 when, when Barack Obama won 51%, right? And a lot of people thought that when Barack Obama stepped off the stage, well, the electorate would go back to being uh, 74, 73, 74, maybe even 75% white, right? But it didn't. You know, the electorate was... It was was between 72 and 70 percent white, uh, which quite frankly should have met uh, a Hillary Clinton victory. The problem was she didn't hold tightly to the Obama coalition, mm. particularly those younger millennial voters, particularly those younger millennials of color uh, that have been talking about sort of protest vote, right? And the younger people were talking about how they really were rejecting our binary lesser of two evils choice. And they did reject the binary and they protested their vote and they voted third party. When you look at, you know, African Americans under 30 nationally, roughly 9% of them voted third party. When you look at Hispanics under 30 nationally, roughly 6 or 7% of them voted third party. And where she was off of Obama's margins was almost, almost exactly the percentage of, of, of our, of our younger people who voted third party. I think the sort of the, the message moving forward is is we have to act as a collective, right? If we're going to stop the electorate and the ghosts of the past from reaching into the future and trying to steal and corrupt uh, the, the future, we have to act collectively. Wow, that's a great that's great information. Again, his name. Cornell Belcher, the book, A Black Man in the White House. Cornell, excellent, man. I appreciate you, what you're doing, man. I can't wait to chop it up in person. And uh, thank you so much for your time. I look forward to it. Yes, man. Thanks so much, man. And again, uh, The Black Man in the White House, Cornell Belcher. Hey, Cornell, can they reach you on Twitter? They can. It's, It's simple, at Cornell Belcher. That's pretty simple, my friend. All right, have a good one, man. It is.